So first, you know, I've got to define what I've talked about on the, on the title slide, which is the art of hacking, the black hats versus, versus white hat. So what is a black hat? All right, so it's usually referred to as a black hat hacker, but hacker is somewhat of a misnomer. Um, a hacker refers to somebody who has a deep understanding of computers and networks. So a computer scientist might consider them a hacker, themselves a hacker. You know, the act of hacking is getting on a computer and hacking something together to make something work. Um, it's not the, the act of cracking, which is what a cracker does, um, which refers to dismantling the security of existing systems. So the word hacker that we typically refer to in kind of modern, modern lingo doesn't actually say what we're really saying. We're really talking about crackers when we're talking about hackers, especially when we're talking about black hat hackers. They're definitely black hat crackers. Um, they're out there to exploit existing systems. Um, so the black hat cracker, strictly speaking, is someone who finds vulnerabilities and uses exploits to some criminal end, um, whether it be making money or, I mean, not that making money is necessarily criminal in and of itself, but, <laughs> but doing so by breaking the law is, is definitely criminal, right? Um, so often when we think of a black hat, we think of some you know, shady figure wearing a hoodie, right? Um, using a laptop with black gloves on. Um, <laughs> but in reality, these are what they typically look like. <laughs> so there's, there's somebody who has not quite grown up, possibly still living in the basement of their mom's house, and you know, just hacking away, doing something, um, and eventually starts getting into um, criminal behavior. They weren't authorized to do whatever they were doing. Um, now, the white hat hacker is not a criminal, right? This is a hacker or, you know, more accurately, a cracker um, that has a work contract with the party um, that, they're, that they're working for, that they're trying to attack. Um, the, you know, the, what they do is they find vulnerabilities in the systems. Um, you know, the National Security Agency has lots of white hat hackers, right? Lots of security researchers. Um, and they employ, you know, the vast majority of probably the entire world's hackers. Um, the, another name for a white hat hacker is the ethical hacker. Um, so other, other types of hats that people wear in this regime, um, in this kind of place, is gray hat. So that's somebody who finds um, vulnerabilities for the purpose of notifying the affected party, um, not, not necessarily to a criminal end, um, they're not trying to exploit them or sell the exploit or anything like that. They just do it just for the sake of notifying people, hey, your website's vulnerable. And then they deface it and say, hey, look, it's broken, just so you know. Um, which is, you know, it, it's borderline criminal, right? It's, um, it's, it's, it's probably breaking some, um, some laws. But sometimes they'll also do this for the means of saying, hey, I'll fix your system. I, I, you know, I, I found a vulnerability. I'll fix it for you. You know, give me hundred dollars an hour, and a couple days later, and I'll have I'll have it fixed for you. Um, so they kind of kind of mean well, kind of not, um, but they don't have a contract in place to actually do what they're doing. So they're doing it, you know, mostly illegally. Um, a script kitty is somebody who uses prepackaged scripts to and known exploits to deal to handle under ex, under patch systems. So an under patch system is something that has known vulnerabilities, they've, they've been published, publicized. There's, there's exploits that are, exist that researchers have made to say, this, this is how you exploit this system. You know, go fix your system, right? And they've given due diligence for giving the, um, the vendor time to actually fix their systems. Um, and so that's, that's what an underpatch system is. And a script kitty basically focuses on using those existing exploits. They don't come up with anything new on their own. They just come up with their own. They, they, they use the existing exploits and just keep running scripts. Um, and that's how a lot of botnet networks are generated and so on. They use existing, existing vulnerabilities and just exploit them over and over and over again on a wide range of systems and build up botnet networks and then they kind of have bragging rights. My botnet's bigger than your botnet, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then in a whole other class of, of people is the cyber warfare, you know, state level actors, right? These are the people that work at, at the NSA. Right, um, and in other, in other first world governments. Um, they're, they're you know, teams of, they're not just one off people working on one, one thing, which is typically the way hackers work, um, but they're in this, in this regime, in this kind of mode of operation, 
um, for cyber warfare, they work in teams. Um, there's, there's typically just, they're extremely smart, you know, elite security researchers who are working really hard um, for some specific goal. They're not trying to find zero day exploit, exploits necessarily. They're trying to find um, a particular way to attack a particular system for a particular end, right? They have very targeted goals. Um, they don't wanna share what they know. They don't wanna talk about what they do. They want to do what they were supposed to do, take down some system and get out. That's, that's you know, they have an actual targeted goal, whereas um, a typical hacker doesn't really have a goal. They're just, so let's see what I can find today. You know, they're after work, they start typing away, trying to find some exploit somewhere that they see if they can find some system for it. What I really wanna talk about today is um, the fundamental conflicts in cybersecurity. So everybody wants security, but there's things that get in the way. Um, and the interesting thing about the things that get in the way is they are not all cyber related. Um, they affect cybersecurity, but they're, they're not cyber related and they affect you know, manager decisions, they affect CEO level decisions, they affect everything that we do um, that has any kind, of, any kind of relevance to security in general. So the primary problem of the systems that we have today is complexity. Complexity is this big problem and it's growing. Um, and for systems to be secure, systems, quite frankly, just cannot be very complex. At least the way we think about them can't be complex. We've got to break them down, make them small problems, solve all those small problems completely, and leave no holes behind. Uh, otherwise, there's going to be a way in, right? So take the Linux kernel, right? So Linux is an operating system, and the latest version of it is 4.5, and these are, this is just some of the data. So SLOC is software lines of code. And if you look at it, so it's mostly written in C. Um, there's 11 million lines of C code. There's, there's about 3,000 lines of header code, which is just basically declarations of functions and, and structures and so on. There's 241,000 lines of assembly, right? I would not want to be the person who had to deal with any of that. Um, and really, there's, there's, you know, there are teams and teams and teams of people working on Linux. Um, it's one of the you know, main operating systems that's out there in the server market. Um, make files, so 33,000 lines of code just to, tell how, just to tell make how to build the code. Right? This is not like software in and of itself, it's just software to tell it how to build the software. Um, and it takes 33,000 lines to do that. Um, and there's you know, over two million comments lines in there. Um, just to give you an, a, a gauge of you know, how huge this is, right? all the combined works of William Shakespeare come out to a little over 100,000 lines. Right? So we're talking lots of William Shakespeare's lifetimes right? going into something like this. Um, I'm not gonna argue whether writing software is more complex than writing Shakespeare, right? I couldn't, I couldn't speak to that, but. So here is the number of lines of code as a function of time for the Linux kernel. So as they keep releasing new and new versions of the Linux kernel, um, 2.6.20 is over there, and then 4.3, the one I was talking about, is not shown on this figure, um, 4.5. Uh, it just keeps growing, just keeps growing. So as you increase the number of lines of code, you're increasing the complexity of, um, of something that can be attacked, right? Linux kernel has been attacked successfully. And they patch it and they move on your way, but it's been attacked um, successfully many times. Uh, not that it's bad software or anything like that. It's extremely good software, but it's, it's still vulnerable to attack. Um, this is one of many architecture diagrams for the Linux kernel, right? I mean, it's like a rat's nest, right? All these different things connected to different pieces. Over here is file systems. And then you have virtual file systems, right? Which you've, you've messed with, right? There's file systems. You put files in file systems. Um, but there's a whole lot of other things that have to go on in a modern operating system that make it extremely complex. Um, so, the Linux kernel is just one part of, the, of a Linux distribution or an operating system. Windows has a kernel as well. Mac, Mac OS X has a kernel based off of BSD. Um, Linux is just another one. And the distribution is essentially the entire 
operating system. It's all the software going into that. Um, and Debian, which is, which is one of the main ones, Ubuntu is built off of it. Um, its compressed size is a little under a gigabyte, which is huge, right? Um, the, the available packages around 17,000. Um, if you just look at the size of the source code packages, you're looking at 64 gigabytes. And when you include all the binary packages, you have an additional um, 262 gigabytes. Um, the, the estimated cost, if you were to use modern um, cost for estimates for um, lines of code, how much does it take to develop one line of code and so on, is to the tune of $17 billion. Right? The Linux kernel cost about a billion dollars to develop. Um, so redeveloping these things or re, you know, making them secu more secure and, and kind of rewriting everything costs right, to that tune of money. Probably less, but, but on, in the same ballpark. Uh, so, so these are huge kind of established pieces of code that make everything work, right? We use, we use these all the time, whether we think about it or not. Um, if we use Google Docs, we're using Linux on a machine running in a Google data center. Um, and if you look at SLOC, SLOC again, remember, is the software lines of code. Um, for Debian 7, which is their, close to their latest release, is 419 million lines of code, right? That's a, that's a, that's a lot of lines. Um, so I wanted to share some famous quotes because these are somewhat insightful for um, complex systems. So the cheapest, fastest, and most reliable components are those that aren't there, right? Which, is, which affects security, right? You can't have a security vulnerability in something that doesn't exist, right? This is, this is good, right? So from a security perspective, one of the things you often want to do is remove things, right? There's, there's some box here, there's a box here, and there's a box here. Can we get away with one box? Is, is there a way of throwing away the other two so that we have one box and then we can focus on making this box really, really secure? Um, so deleted code is debug code, um, right? I've also heard this as, you know, the best patch I've ever submitted or the, my best days at work are the ones where I've, you know, removed more code than added it. Um, often you're measured by how much code you add, how many lines did you author. But um, in, in reality, it's even better to be able to delete code. Because uh, that reduces complexity, right? So controlling complexity is the essence of computer programming, right? Which, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, now, simplicity is the prerequisite for security, which is one of the things that I'm arguing. Um, and it's, it's, it's critical, right? We, it's no way, there is no way to secure complex systems. Uh, and so figuring out how to make systems Simple, as simple as possible, is a big part of thinking about security the, the right way. Um, so complexity kills. It sucks the life out of developers, and it makes products difficult to build, to plan, build, and test. It introduces security challenges, and it causes end user and administrator frustration. Um, often, really big, complicated software projects are replaced wholesale by smaller ones that figured out how to do it how to do the same exact functions, but they figured out how to do it in, much, in a much cleaner, um, you know, less lines of code, just cleaner way, building on other libraries and so on. Um, this happens all the time with Python libraries, with um, Node.js libraries, where sm tiny little libraries will come up and then a smaller one will come up and just beat it because, in far as popularity and usability because it does one thing and it does it really well, um, but it does it in a much simpler fashion. So here's the fundamental problem with respect to complexity, is that mankind is creating ever-increasingly complex systems. Um, I mean, you look at anything around you. You look at your phone, right? The thing is, is growing in, in feature set. The problem is the economic drive for, um, for quickly developing new features is increasing complexity. There's lots of things that are, that are driving, you know, from an economic perspective, new features, right? Customers, you know, consumers, us, right, are are driving complexity. We want a new feature in a phone. We want something like that. That causes the complexity of the system to increase, and it generally causes the security of the system to decrease. For the computer science students that are in the room, after writing a working program, right, how often do you go back, um, review the code in an effort to heavily refactor it, change it all over the place, such that it is much more simplified, much cleaner, nicer, maybe fewer lines of code, um, more concise, before submitting it, right? 
Very few, I would argue, do that. Some do, um, and those are the ones I want to talk to. But the, the, um, the ones, but the ones who don't, you know, the reason you don't do that, it's, it's rational, right? It's, I might break it if I flip everything around and change it and see if I can f find a better way to make this work. But that's how you learn how to make things work in a, in a simpler fashion is by writing code over again and again and again. Um, a secondary problem, so the, remember the primary problem is complexity. The secondary problem is um, under-prioritized. I couldn't come up with a better word than that, if that's a word. Security is often at a lower priority than it ought to be. So if you look at the Office of Personnel Management, um, hackers or crackers, because they broke the security of the system, um, they ex between March and April of last year, they exfiltrated, to the, which means they stole, essentially. Um, now, you can't steal data. It's not like money where you steal it, right? You're just making a copy of it. OPM still has the data, um, but hackers have it as well. 22 million identities of US citizens, including their SF-86. SF-86 is a pretty sensitive document for people who have classified security clearances. Um, some of those were stolen. And then also 5.6 million fingerprints of those people who have clearances. Um, that's a huge, huge data breach um, of highly sensitive data from the United States government. Um, so how is it carried out? Nothing more than social engineering was used. They found um, an employee who had valid user credentials and they were able to social engineer those credentials out of him. Um, phishing emails, you know, I don't know the details, that wasn't released. but. Um, they were able to extract the user credentials and then log into the systems and get all the data they needed. Um, the Office of the Inspector General, that's OIG, um, reported from 2007 all the way up to 2014 um, and cautioned, so basically they have to give reports every year to OPM, and every year they gave them reports on, you have dangerously underpatched systems, so they knew they had issues, right? They couldn't, they couldn't kind of deny this. They knew they had issues. Um, they didn't do anything about it. They had 11 servers um, that were operating without author the authorization to operate, the ATO. Um, for, for, for highly sensitive systems, this authorization to operate is a pretty important thing. Um, it's the authorization for somebody to say, you can turn this thing on now. Um, and they had 11 servers that really should not have been on. Um, and so they had, they had old systems, they knew about it, they chose not to do anything about it, and eventually they got nailed for it, right? Um, and one, one thing that's interesting is that OPM has no CISO, so that's the, the chief information security officer, that's the guy, that's the C-level guy who's in charge of security. They didn't have one, um, which, which kind of goes to the argument of they didn't prioritize data security as high as they ought to have. Um, for, some, for an organization where data security is one of their primary concerns, um, they, should have, they should have prioritized that higher, and they didn't. And, they, and they, you know, the director of the OPM ended up resigning as a result of this data breach. Right? She lost her job. Um, all right, so this, this, is, this is, you know, businesses, they always make decisions based on the information they have available and how to better the business, right? And how to make more profit, how to, how to, you know, they always make decisions based on that. So it's an easy decision to, you know, after there's a security compromise, some data is lost, or you may write minor or major, um, it's pretty easy to make the argument that you want to invest in more security at that point in time, right? We, we goofed up, we don't have enough, we got compromised, time to invest in more security. Um, it's, and, you know, because it's clear that you have insufficient security. Um, but however, the company is already lost at this point. Right? The data is gone. It doesn't come back. Right? No matter what you do, it's never coming back. Um, you, there's already the press releases. There's already publicity that's all very negative. Um, you're already losing money as a result of this. And, and now you have to invest even more money to build up your, your infrastructure to be more resilient to these types of to attacks. Um, if, you, if you look at Target, as in Target, the, the retailer, uh, in 2013, they leaked 40 million credit cards. Uh, and that, that cost them to the tune of 260 to a billion dollars. Um, they had to 
they had to pay for all sorts of things, not just fixes of their um, security, but lost revenue and, uh, and all sorts of other ramifications from it, insurance claims and court cases and so on. Um, and they're still paying for that. That's in 2013 and they're still paying for it from a financial perspective. Right, so yes, I'm sure Target's not gonna get hacked anytime soon, right? So it's probably a good place to go shopping. But, you know, because you're, you're sure that the engineers and the security people there, they've got more money than they know what to do with trying to figure out how to secure their system so it doesn't happen again. Um, but, the, the, you know, the company's already lost. Um, it's a much, much harder decision for management to, to have no security breach um, since maybe some last improvement, right? So say you, maybe you had a security breach, but you made an improvement. I bought a new router, or I bought a new firewall, or upgraded this, or I did some incremental improvement. Um, it's really hard for them to decide to invest in more security at that point, right? It's just a hard argument to make, right? An IT person might come to you know, a, a high-level meeting of management and say, we need more of this. We don't think we have enough of this. There's, there's no way to make that argument um, and win in and of itself, just by, by merit alone. Um, you know, when do they know that they have enough security? They, they, they don't, it's a hard question to answer. There's no hard and fast rule. You have enough, you have enough when you don't get hacked, but you know, enough today is not the same as enough tomorrow. Um, and you're probably not getting hacked just because nobody doesn't care about, you know, just, just because nobody cares about your website today, right? Um, so, you know, and of course, another thing to keep in mind is systems are never fully secure. Um, it's always a compromise. Um, perfect security is not, is not the goal, right? We want to we wanna get there. We want to get to perfect security, but if you had to make a perfectly secure system, it really wouldn't exist, right? It'd be disconnected, put in a closet somewhere, locked and keyed with a guard out front, and nobody would use it, right? It wouldn't do anything for you. So, Going back to that question of when do you know you have enough security, right? So you look at this door, and the question is, do you have enough locks? It's, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. You know, probably overkill as far as the locks, given that the door is probably not made of steel, right? It looks like it's made of wood. Um, but, you know, I'm surprised, you know, I didn't, I couldn't find a picture with a retina scan on it or something, but um, they, you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to come up with this answer. You know, what, if, you look at your, um, if you look at your house or your apartment or your dorm and you look at the lock and you say, well, is my lock good enough, right? Or is my locks, maybe I have multiple locks, good enough. One way of doing that is comparing to your neighbors and saying, well, do I, do I have better security than my, than my neighbors? Um, and I'll, I'm gonna elaborate on that point in a second. This is, I just, just thought this was cool. Um, I, I, I think this kind of lock is pretty fun. Um, unless there's a fire, I guess. Um, and you're trying to get out, then you're like, ah, oh, what was the puzzle again? Um, so the, one of the problems is that there's a very minimal, there is some, but there's a very minimal open um, dialogue between companies about their safeguards. Company A does not say, I use this vendor and this vendor and I have things set up this way and I, I use this firewall and I'm protected against this by this, this, and this, and so on. And then vendor B, you know, they're not gonna, if they, if they don't think they measure up to vendor A, they're not gonna talk, right? There's not this open dialogue of, oh yeah, well, we have a guy in the corner that sometimes looks at logs, you know, and when he's in, but you know, he's off most of summer, and you know, they're not gonna talk about that, right? And um, the vast majority of companies feel they have less security than they ought to. Um, and, there's been a ramp up in, in spending in this area, so they're, you know, they're realizing it, but um, generally it's, it's the, you know, my security is always an adequate kind of mentality, and so why would you talk about your security? But you still need to talk about your security so that you can, you can compare and contrast, and, and then, then you'd have an argument. When you go to a CEO, you could say, um, if you're a security person at a company, you could say, well, company X over here, you know, our competitor, or in a similar market segment or whatever, is doing X, Y, and Z for their security, and we're doing you know, half of X, right? We need to step it up. We need, maybe let's get X and let's get Y this year. Maybe we can get Z next year. Um, but there, that dialogue doesn't exist for the most part. Um, you, can, you can look at this from, a, from a, another perspective, um, from 
bear bag. So I don't know anybody who's a backpacker, but, but I like backpacking. Um, and one fact is that bears like eating backpackers' food. Right? They, they like it. They like it better than, than fish, I guess. Um, and another fact is that backpackers like eating their food. Right? So the solution that is commonly in place is to hang um, your food in bags, which are called bear bags, um, sufficiently high in trees to deter the bears. Um, now, let's assume that there's multiple backpackers camping at the same site. Um, so now the question is, what does sufficiently high mean? Right? What is the level of security that I need for my food? Um, you do not need an optimal bear bag configuration. Right? So an optimal bear bag configuration might be something like, I have a counterbalance. You put two bear bags up there, and you counterbalance them up there. Um, so there's no rope hanging, hanging down that's pulling it up. So you know, like that's a little more secure. I prefer that approach, actually. Um, but then there's the booby trap approach. Right? Maybe we'll hang some pots underneath it. So when the bear swipes at it, they'll hit the pots. And then you can wake up and you know, assemble the army and, and run, run the bear off. Um, or you can post an armed guard. You know armed with a rock or, or something, right? Um, and, and some good running shoes. And then, um, <laughs> or, you know, the, the next bar down is, well, um, you just, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't really need the highest bear bag, right? Um, and then the kind of the lowest bar is, well, you only need to have not the lowest bear bag. So if this is the lowest bear bag, as long as mine is, is up here, I'm good. Because the assumption is, well, the bear is going to attack the, smaller, the lower one, right? He'll go after the, the easy one. Um, and I would argue that that's a flawed assumption in our, in our logic as far as this goes. And I've, I've seen this, this analogy used in security realms before. But I would argue it's a, it's a fallacy. Um, why? Because the bear might like one, pa one backpacker s'mores much better than some other backpackers dehydrated food, right? Um, s'mores smells, smells a lot better, tastes a lot better. Um, and so the bear might have a preference of, of one bag over the other. Um, taking this back to hacking, the black hat hackers, the bears in this case, right, have um, targeting priorities based on monetary gain, based on you know, maybe just a bad shopping experience. Um, Maybe a grudge, maybe bragging rights, right? Maybe some friend said, hey, if you crack this site, I'll give you 10 bucks or whatever. I don't know. That'd be a pretty terrible you know, waste of days. But, um, <laughs> but people have done stupider things. So um, the, the, you know, things like ease of exploitation, um, they matter, right? We, need, we, want, we want the bear bag to be high. It doesn't have to be on the moon, but it needs to be high. Um, because you don't know the preferences of the attacker. You don't know the preferences of the bear. Um, and you know, we only want acrobatic bears getting our food. We only want the ones who are really, really good um, getting our food. We don't want the script kitty or the gray hat hacker or anything. We want the honest to goodness, really, really bad, bad guys to be the only ones who can actually get our stuff. And in that case, we still don't want them to get our stuff, right? Um, so only needing security better than the worst is setting the bar somewhere in the mud. It's just setting the bar way too low um, for where we need to be. So the, another, another one of these secondary problems that we have is just lack of training. Um, Undertrained, kind of at all levels of. It's not just that. What I want, one thing I want to point out is this problem is not just a a uh, information technology or a security operations group problem. It is much broader than that because product design decisions affect security. Um, budgeting decisions affect what security can do. Um, staffing, everything affects security in some way or another these days. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Um, but as everything gets more and more digital, that becomes more and more true. So there is a cybersecurity education gap. So it turns out that none of the top 10 computer science universities um, have required cybersecurity courses within their major. Um, some of them don't even have elective options. Um, so I don't think they would argue that computer that cybersecurity education is is not valuable. I think they would argue it is valuable, but 
they're just prioritizing other things. Um, you know, that I gotta fit that algorithms class in that curriculum. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have the algorithms class in there or the, some, other, some other database class or something, right? That they would argue is more valuable than security. Um, and when, when push comes to shove, security doesn't quite make it in. And so for the top 10 computer science universities, this is the case, which is interesting. Um, as, as Dr. Wallace mentioned, we have added an information security major, you know, kind of for this reason, right? We're trying to increase, to kind of decrease the education gap in cybersecurity. Um, and we think a Christian school is a very unique opportunity for that to happen because of the ethical aspects of this. The things you learn um, in information security can be used for good or for bad, right? Um, you can put your black hat on, and you can put your white hat on, right? And we want to make sure that we're training up people who only want to put their white hats on. <laughs> uh, they're going to burn their black hats. Um, all right, so executives. So this is at the highest level of organizations. Um, so the San Francisco Business Times very recently did a survey of 1,500-ish um, C-level executives, and most of them, the majority of them, felt that cybersecurity was a IT problem, which, when you look at the problem this way, you're, you're not seeing the whole picture, right? Security is not an IT problem. Um, the, the, a C-level executive clicking on a phishing email, which is called you know, whaling, right? So there's, there's phishing, right? Which is you're phishing for, for um, a, a, an, an attack, a, a person to attack, right? You're sending an email, send, and they'll send out mass emails, right? Um, but um, spear phishing is a little more targeted, and then whaling is when you're going after the big wigs, the whales, right? Those are the CEOs. Um, or the CIOs and so on. And those are the ones who have passwords to extremely important things, right? Big bank accounts and so on. Um, and you, you, can't, you can't think about the problem as security is just an IT problem. My computer is, is my computer. Maybe, maybe um, IT can solve this problem for me. They can't. That's not the way it works. Um, everybody has to have a security kind of mindset to keep their systems secure um, so that, um, I mean, I, the IT problem is they're, they're, they get to deal with the servers and infrastructure and the networking and those kinds of things, but your computer and what you do on your computer can seriously compromise your computer, right? Um, and your passwords and everything else that you have access to. Um, you know, CLO executives, they have, they have influence over product roadmaps, which can affect security. What features do you implement, right? Certain features can, can cause a nightmare from a security perspective. Um, they have influence over budgets, and they have influence over, over how they prioritize things, um, how they order work. Um, another interesting thing that came out of this survey is that 91% say they cannot interpret a cyber security report, right? So this is bad, right? So not only do they think it's an IT problem, is not only, you know, this is 91%, this is a large majority, don't know what the lingo is, don't know how to speak cybersecurity talk. Um, now, this is, you think of this as a two-way problem, right? There's the IT side don't know how to present the information in such a way that um, the C-level executives can actually understand it. But the C-level executives also need to understand what's going on, right? They need to understand what's going on in the company. Um, Target, you know, I'm pretty sure they do not think that cybersecurity is an IT problem alone anymore, right? I'm, very, I'm sure that the C-level executives are very aware of security. And, and checking in and asking, so how are we doing? Did we meet that milestone? Did we get there? Um, so, you know, the, the CLO executives, they're lacking necessary background. There is some education things that are coming up for CLO executives to help bridge that gap, um, which is good. Um, but, you know, this is just the fundamental lack of visibility in the potential cybersecurity problems. Um, all right, so. Consumers, so we talked about C-level executives, now I wanna talk about consumers, right? So at the time of purchasing, right, when you go and you're running through Target, right, because we just keep harping on Target, but you're running through wherever, Walmart, wherever it may be, um, and you're trying to you know, pick out something that you need, that you need um, you're, you're, not, you're not thinking about security, almost surely, right? Um, and a lot of things, when you're, you know, when you're picking out chapstick, you don't need to think about security, right? There's no security aspects to that. 
but to a lot of other things there are. Um, if you think about all the Internet of Things that's coming about, things like um, smart thermostats, which connect to the Internet and adjust your temperature and so on and maybe warm your house up before you get home kind of thing, right? They have nice benefits, right? They have nice features. But Internet of Things is a very, it's a very scary place from a security researcher perspective. They've written tons of articles saying, yeah, this is, this is not secure, this is not secure, this is known to not be secure. They didn't even try here, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's just all over the place. Um, but that's not going to affect consumers' purchasing habits, right? They're still going to buy these things. Um, and so security's got to, you know, got to catch up, right? The engineering has to catch up with the actual demand. Um, the, you know, no one ever goes into buying a product that has some security relevance like a thermostat and ask, you know, thinking about it this way, no, you know, I think, I think I want to buy the more expensive device that has fewer features because it is more secure. No one ever thinks like that, right? There's very few people that would think like that, and they all work for the federal government. Um, <laughs> they, you know, you know, federal government's like, can I get the thing that's 10 times more expensive and maybe 1% more secure? Like, yes, that's a trade-off I want to make, right? But, you know, in, in, in consumer land, you never think like that. However, security still affects you, um, especially with Internet of Things taking over. Um, you're, it might affect you monetarily. For instance, the case of the thermostat that I was just mentioning. Um, what happens if a hacker finds an exploit for your type of thermostat? Right. right now, there's three, four, five different types of thermostats. So they find one. That's a huge market share, right? One fifth of the market. Um, they find an exploit. They apply it to all thermostats, and they um, raise your temperature in your house in the winter by 20 degrees, right? Just, just at night or just when you're away, maybe, right? Just when they realize you're away because those thermostats know when you're away. And then you get the bill at the end of the month, and it's five times higher than it, than it used to be, right? Now there's a monetary impact of things like that. Now, sure, that'll get patched, right? They'll fix it. They'll fix it. They'll realize, oh, something went wrong, and they'll they'll come and fix it. Um, the security, you know, there'll be a fire drill, and, and all the security people will get together and ah, let's fix it, fix it quick, and then it'll get fixed, and and then they'll move on their way. But the damage is done, right? That's the problem. They lost the battle. Um, they didn't lose the war, but they lost the battle. In engineering, we often speak of trade-offs. Trade-offs are things that you have to give up to gain something else. And um, so, for instance, you often can't improve one objective without compromising the others. Um, you, in business, these are often thought of as Pareto fronts. Um, but in engineering, we think of them as trade-offs. And a perfectly secure system is completely unusable and cheap. Right? How do you make a perfectly secure system? It doesn't exist. Right? You just don't make it. Right? That's how you solve that problem. Um, so, so if we want something that's perfectly secure, we, we've lost already. Uh, we don't have a product. So the one thing that's interesting is that consumers drive the product design um, to, toward usability and toward lower cost. Right? We wanna, when we're looking for products, we're always going for that lower cost item. And we're looking for the one that has more features or is more usable in some fashion. Right? Um, and it's, it's one of those two. Maybe it's a combination of the two. We're not necessarily looking for the one that's more secure, but this is the trade-off space that we're left with. Um, if you want to make something more secure, it's going to be slightly less usable, possibly. Um, and it's going to probably not be quite as cheap, because it's going to take more development time to, to build that thing, to test it, to make sure that it's bulletproof, um, figuratively speaking, unless you really need it bulletproof. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the government, for instance, right, they, they flip this around on its head. Right? The government often prioritizes security over cost and often usability. Now, they don't do this always. right? We talked about OPM. OPM didn't get it right. They didn't prioritize things properly. Um, but um, I'm, you know, I'm sure they are now, but, but they weren't then. Um, so you know, highly, system, highly secure systems, they're a pain to use. Um, but but they exist is the point. So some people have, a, have an impression that I'm just going to buy that, that silly thermostat. It's going to be, you know, it's going to work. It's fine. No one's going to, no one's going to try to hack it. And that's, that's a fair statement, um, though they've been hacked. Um, and other things like it have been hacked. But and then we kind of give up and say, well, 
ah, no secure system exists, thus we're going to move on. Well, that's not, and I said you know, earlier, no perfectly secure system exists, which that's, that's true. But you can still make a secure system. And secure systems do exist. Um, the government has plenty of them, and there are plenty of systems that we use that are, that are solid, that are very secure. Um, but they've been around for a long time and tested well and, and, and validated. Uh, and hackers have tried and tried and tried, and they haven't succeeded. At least not recently, so um, they're, they're deemed secure. Um, so as of late, um, the security community is somewhat floundering. They're kind of scrambling, trying to get, get, um, make heads or tails of what's going on. Um, so I, I want to make the analogy to a student behind on his homework, right? So you finish your, so when you're, when you're behind, when you're, I got to just get this stuff done, um, which must not be none of you since you have time to talk you know, in my, you have to have time to come to this. Um, but you finish your homework as quickly as possible, right? You go, you go through it and just charge um, as quickly as possible. You, you know, you fail to take the extra step to learn from the homework, right? The homework exists not so you can get it done, but so that you can learn something, right? So you go through, go through, and then you don't step back and say, well, did I really learn what they were trying to tell me? Did I really understand what was going on? You don't necessarily take that step. Um, instead, you focus on completing the homework and then moving on to pro probably the next homework assignment, right? Or getting to bed. Um, white hat hackers are kind of in the same boat. They're trying to find the vulnerability before the black hat hacker, right? So the white hat is trying to find the vulnerabilities um, before the black hat can so that they can get it fixed and released and distributed to everywhere such that the black hat has no chance of exploiting it. Um, and so there's this kind of battle going on. And the, the security researchers who didn't used to be in that game, um, they used to think more about fundamental problems of security and how do you solve this and how do you build secure protocols and how do you maybe make new programming languages that are more secure and, and so on. Um, they're, they're kind of being morphed into white hat hackers in the sense that they are focusing on getting um, getting notoriety by not researching some new, new way of solving some, some ancient problem of, of that, that plagues security, but they're looking at, I found a buffer overflow, right? I found some place where you missed an if statement, ha ha, right? And then they submit it and they get money. Um, so there's, for Chrome, for instance, um, Google offers a bug bounty system where you can submit, based on how, how severe it is, you can submit your, your, your bug and they will they will, they will give you money, they'll give you a check. Um, now, I'm not saying those things are bad. Those things are good. It's improved the security of Chrome considerably. Um, but it's made a kind of a marketplace of, you know, these vulnerabilities are now marketable. Um, they're marketable in, in two cents. So there's the kind of white hat area of, um, of things like Chrome and operating systems ha offering bug bounties, right? Um, that's, that's one way of making money, and that's, a, that's legal, it's all, it's all clean. Um, but then there's the dark web, things like the Tor network and cryptocurrency, um, like Bitcoin, join forces to build kind of the perfect storm of, now, there's, now you can set up pretty, re pretty easily, easily markets to sell exploits. Um, the most common exploit that you'd sell in such a market is something that's called a zero day attack. A zero day attack, the zero means the developer of the the system that's being attacked has zero days to fix the vulnerability because it's not out in the public yet. Once it goes out in the public, once it's used, it'll get detected and hopefully, right? And um, then the developer will be notified, the developer can fix it, and he'll have, you know, the clock starts ticking. This is day one, day two, day three until the patch actually gets released and everything gets distributed. And then that zero day exploit loses its value, right? Once, once it's out there, once it's patched, Zero day exploits, they're no longer zero day exploits. They're, they're spent, essentially. Um, so this table over here shows some interesting numbers. Um, between 2007 and 2012, there was to the tune of eight to 15 attacks per year um, that, were, that, were zero, that were zero day attacks um, and that were found. And in 2013, it went up to 23, 2014 it went up to 24, and then 2015, last year, it went up to 54. That's a big number, right? The, that curve is, is going up. I don't want to, I'm curious what 2016 brings, but um, also at the same time, not so much. 
right? It's going to be a bigger number, almost surely. Um, so the point is, you know, current efforts, they're not working, right? So some, something, has to, something has to change. And I would argue we need to get back to um, not, not just finding vulnerabilities and patching them, but making sure the vulnerabilities didn't get there in the first place by changing the way we develop software and um, changing the tools we use to develop software so they don't happen ever again. Uh, so <coughs> complexity is the primary reason why conducting and operating secure systems is so difficult. I've talked a lot about software security, but this also applies to operational security. How do you actually operate um, systems securely? Um, you know, so when you, when you, as a developer or as a um, marketing manager or as a CLO executive and you're looking at, I want to add a new feature to our product, how do I do it? Um, you know, it's easy to increase the complexity of the system when you add such a feature. I'm going to add a feature, so I'm adding to the complexity. I'm going to add this module and then it'll work. And it'll be good. Um, but I would argue it's pure brilliance when you can actually do so by reducing the complexity of the system. It's possible um, in many, many cases, but um, the goal ought to be to reduce the complexity of the system at every iteration. Um, it's a much harder task, but I think it's a noble one. Um, so cybersecurity, it's everybody's problem. Um, everybody must contribute to the solution, right? It's a management level problem, a misconception kind of issue, an education issue, kind of at all levels, whether it be in the in the um, engineering, computer science side of things, in the information technology kind of operation side of things, um, and in the consumers themselves, right? Consumers drive this whole thing. We're, we're the ones who are on the, have our hands on the steering wheel. Um, and so, so consumers, consumers affect this as well. Um, and that is it. seems to me to be defensive. In other words, you're plugging holes, vulnerabilities, and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What could you do offensively? For example, program, put a program in your system that when it detects a hacker, it crashes the hacker's computer. So there are these things called honeypots, which um, they are systems that are out there that hackers don't know about. They just look like any other server on the network. And they're designed in such a way that the, um, they're fairly easy to exploit. They have, they have known vulnerabilities that are not patched, so they're under patched systems. And they have monitoring software on them. So they monitor where the attackers are coming from, source IP addresses, things like that. So everybody come, the hackers come in and start exploiting it, like, oh, I found a cool machine. They, don't, they just know it's IP address, blah, 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 right? And, um, they go and work, 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 and, and then the um, security researchers can just see. They're just, you know, imagine like a computer with a big piece of glass over it, right? They're, they're, they're watching the computer, watching, seeing, seeing, you know, what the attacker is doing, how they're exploiting things, what they're, what they're doing. And if anything's new, they can, they can take that and, and learn from it. And they can get attackers' IP addresses, for instance, as a result of that. Um, one thing that's done with those is that those are blacklisted on other routers all over the place. So when those guys are coming in, like, oh, well, he's not a legitimate internet user right now. So that IP address will blacklist him. So you to design a system that will, in fact, uh, infect or put a virus in that hacker's uh, computer system or in some way aggressively, offensively destroy the, the cracker? Um, in, in some cases, I've seen botnets come, be taken down that way, where a botnet is essentially there's a command control node, and then there's a bunch of bots. And you can, you, can, you can infiltrate the botnet network to the point of taking down the head. And then that kills all of its bots. They, can't, they don't have anyone to talk to, and so they, they all die. Um, that's one like, offensive attack that has been done. But that's, that's a, the, the offensive attack is something that is usually not done by companies. It's usually done by the government because you know, it, it's law enforcement kind of thing. Do, you, I have, do I have the authority, the you know, lawful right to take down someone else's computer, even if they're messing with me? Right? It would seem to me that that would be less expensive and less confusing and less difficult 
than what you describe as a defense? I think you need, I think you need both. Um, but an attack on a um, attacker's computer would still require things like zero-day attacks. You still would need some, because they're going to defend themselves. So you still need some way that they're, they're going to patch their systems very well, right? Because they know better. So um, finding a zero-day attack on that will work for those types of guys. You know, zero-day attacks, like I said, they're pretty marketable. They're not something you want to just throw at anybody. You want to throw at it when you, when you really need it. But I, I, I like that idea. I mean, that is a valid point. Uh, how, much are, how much do people pay for a zero-day attack on the dark web? Um, it, it, it varies widely because some attacks might just be a, a, privilege, a privilege escalation type of attack. Well, that's actually a pretty good attack. But um, some of them might be network born, where you can get to them from the network. Some of them you have to actually be logged in the machine, and then you can use a zero day. So to, to exploit a system, you might need multiple zero day attacks. Um, they, they can go, I mean, I've, I've heard of ones going for a million dollars. How much like a network penetration test, they can like protect your system, like how often they should be um, So network penetration testing is, you know, one of the things that like a, an ethical hacker or a white hat hacker, right, would do. Um, and your, your question is how often should they be done? You know, the, the, the rule of thumb is you, you look at those things anytime you make system changes that affect things. You change the firewall that you might want to run it again to make sure that your firewall change did exactly what you thought it did and didn't open up five other ports that you weren't expecting or so on. Penetration testing is, is just one aspect of, of um, of hacking, I guess, is what I would say. Mm -hmm. I believe after the Hartley vulnerability, President Obama released new rules um, to the federal agencies which investigate things like this, that they should, instead of stockpiling as many vulnerabilities, they should release some of them to vent more of them to vendors. What do you think about the balance between that? The, see, the, the government is in, a, is in a tricky spot from the standpoint of the zero-day vulnerabilities that they work so hard to find, right? They put their, their best on it and they find these zero-day exploits. They, they have to choose. Do I want to tell the vendor of this zero-day exploit that um, you have a problem and here you go, right? This is, how you, this is how you fix it, right? And they'll go quick, fix it, get to release, and then that zero-day exploit all of a sudden has zero value, right, to the United States government. But it has value to everybody else, right? Every, every system is more secure now. Um, so that's their dilemma, right? Their kind of viewpoint of this is that. Now, President Obama um, wants to increase sharing of that type of information for sure with, and they're trying, they're trying to build avenues. See, the thing is, is all that information is mostly classified, right? Um, it comes out of NSA with, you know, big red stamps on it, right? So the, the means of getting it, figuring out what information would be valuable and getting it to the appropriate private um, sector folks is, is, is still TBD. They're still trying to figure out what that looks like. As far as the uh, attacks that um, countries make on other countries, can you speak on the uh, Iran um, attacks that happened several years ago and how that could be a threat to uh, through the internet, not just through a hard connection through USB? Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's been attacks on Iran, you know, the Stunksnet attack that was, that happened um, in Iran. You can, I've talked to you know, mostly about network-borne things, but yeah, the, the one in Iran used a USB thumb drive as a means of moving the virus around. So um, in that case, it's, it's said, you know, it's kind of, the US government hasn't claimed it, but it's, it's said that the US government was actually the attacker in that case, along with Israel. Um, to attack the centrifuges in Iran, um, to destroy them. And, and so, the, that, and that was a case where it's not network born, it was USB thumb drives insect, infected and then worked its way over to the centrifuge computer and spun up centrifuge and destroyed it um, in a very, very clever way. Um, and that was, that was that's, they spent on that attack multiple zero days vulnerabilities. Um, 
But that was an example of a, count, of a very targeted attack, right? It was, it was something that was targeted just for those centrifuges. They could use a zero-day attack to do all sorts of things, but they wanted to, to shut down the Iranian nuclear capability, or at least take it back a step. Well, let's thank Dr. Carfrey once again.